The importance of speed. Speed is another skill you should master in Photoshop. I'll say this right from the beginning, nobody likes sloppy work, but that's not what I'm advocating here. You shouldn't sacrifice quality for speed. Let me tell you a quick story to illustrate my point. When I got started using Photoshop for web design, I didn't have a clue about it. I had no formal training whatsoever. What I did have were lots of projects courtesy of 99designs, Crowdspring, Hatchwise and other platforms, and a few training materials from YouTube and Lynda.com. No shame to admit it, I used torrents to get Photoshop and whatever else I needed because I didn't have a dime to my name, literally. So when I started learning and working, I quickly found out how little I knew. I realised there were so many great designers out there that were miles away from my skill level. How could I compete? It would take months, maybe years, until I could reach a decent skill level, let alone catch up. And then I started thinking, how can I get an upper hand? How could I get ahead of the pack? I tried being very creative, very out there with my ideas, but of course that failed. I tried putting lots of mental energy into each project, trying to think and overthink each element, but of course that failed too. I lacked knowledge and I lacked the time to obtain it. And there was my answer. Time. If I could manage to get more time, I'd be golden. Since I couldn't sleep less, and believe me I tried, or increase the number of hours in a day, I did what you already know. I increased my speed, thus getting more done in less time. This to me was the best way I could pull ahead of everybody else. By working hard on a tight schedule and being very disciplined, I could quickly close the gap between me and all the other designers out there. I'd basically give myself a boost. And indeed it worked for me. First I started off by learning how to read faster. I used different techniques and programs and I eventually got significantly faster. But the key here was the video content. I then found out I could use BS Player to increase the video speed with Shift F5. I started with 120%, then 150% and I kid you not, I started watching tutorials at 180% speed. I tried 200% but then I couldn't follow the commentary anymore. At 180% the voice was very high pitched but it didn't bother me. I adjusted myself to the speed and I began understanding everything. Moreover, these tutorials showed me very basic things, so I got bored listening at anything below 150%. There weren't any great techniques or design principles, even if the course was labelled as advanced or mastery. I was really disappointed that there wasn't anything better available on the market. That's what actually drove me to create my first course, Learn Photoshop, Web Design and Profitable Freelancing. Now things have changed a bit and I do recognise those basic tutorials did play a role in my development. Yet I still see very little great material out there that really aims to teach you the real stuff. So to sum this part up, I began learning at a very rapid pace in order to get more time. It was difficult at first, but I quickly got used to it and I could focus on the 5 to 10 minutes that actually mattered out of a 60 minute course. So I got that handled, I slurped up as much information as I could. In the meantime, I was still designing, but the goal here was to be as fast as possible. I really aimed to do everything in less steps. Hotkeys were a major part in this. I learned them all and I quickly began using my mouse and my keyboard like I was an experienced piano player doing his thing at full blast. I cut out every little intermediate step I could think of. Just as an example, I bought the fastest, cheapest gaming mouse out there, the A4 Tech X7. I set it at 3200 DPI and if you don't know what that is, well it's crazy fast, you just touch it a bit and it flies. When I had several windows open, and mind you I had only one very tired monitor, I hated wasting time getting to my desktop. So I programmed one of the mouse buttons to minimise all windows. This made a big difference in my workflow. I'm not sure if this seems like sound advice, or you think it's a bit of an obsession, but I have to say that these things shaped me to be the designer I am today. I basically shortened the learning curve. Everybody knows that when you first start a new activity, it's going to seem very difficult, no matter what it is. As time goes by, it becomes easier and easier. Picture driving a car, swimming, or riding a bike. So if you could shorten that awful period where you're frustrated because you don't know what to do, then you'll get to the good stuff faster. First, learn the basic tools, hotkeys and what they do. Then practice by doing lots of projects and cutting out any inefficient steps. 
This is why I tell people to organize their layers panel. That's one of the aspects that determines your speed. So that's how I got ahead, by working harder and faster in order to shorten the learning curve. You're bound to fail no matter what. The idea is to learn from your mistakes, implement the new knowledge into your workflow, and repeat. So what are some tips you could use to speed things up? Learn all the major hotkeys. You have a cheat sheet in this course. Get a fast mouse with programmable buttons. Set them for things like minimize all windows or go back. Set your browser to download everything on your desktop, then keep it impeccable. Everything organized properly, and when the project is over, delete what's not needed. Things like icons, vectors, images, you name it. Name and group at least 80% of all your layers. Use the search feature built into the Layers panel. When you have an idea, go do it, don't second think it. Then group it, and if you have another idea for that region, do that one as well. Compare, then decide which is better. The number one tip that I'd like to leave you with is this. Set a goal in your mind to become faster. If you do this, everything will fall into place. If you have the will to be faster, no matter what, you will find shortcuts in your workflow that will help you achieve your goal. Everybody is different, so not all these tips will apply to you, but if you think of something for yourself, it's sure to work. Choosing the right projects Choosing the right projects makes all the difference in the world. Besides the obvious monetary gain, you'll also boost your design passion, you'll be more relaxed, and last but not least, more confident. So how do you select the best projects for you? Let's assume you're working on a design platform similar to 99designs. So a place where you must compete in a design contest alongside other designers from all over the world. Here, all briefs follow the same structure and you can filter out unwanted contests. So what should you look for? What's the right project for you? First of all, think about your experience. If you're just starting out, I recommend you bang out tens, even a few hundred websites quickly in a matter of three to six months without any filters. Do them all. That may seem very daunting for people who are just starting out, but there's nothing better than a tight schedule of three to four contests per day almost every day. This will increase your speed, your knowledge, and it will desensitize you. It will make you no longer love your designs with all your heart because guess what? Probably 80 to 90% of them will get rejected. Learning how to handle your emotions is a tricky business. There's no easy way to get accustomed to it. So by repeating the process over and over, you should reassess and detach yourself from your work. This is obviously a painstaking grind, but it will put a serious dent in your learning curve. As you get more experience, I recommend you specialize in a particular field. This is so you increase your chances of making an honest dollar out of your designs. This won't apply to every single person watching this course, but for a large part, this is the best way to win a few thousand dollars each month. So see what you're good at. Maybe it's corporate websites, maybe it's e-commerce sites or blogs. Considering you just ground out lots of designs, you should have a clear idea which ones appeal to you the most. You should be able to clearly rank your designs by their level of quality too. So with that in mind, just browse through the categories until you find projects that suit you best. Then design, design, design. Learn from your mistakes, from the feedback you receive, until you finally get some wins. The main idea is, the more you do a certain thing, the better you become at it. That's why those who are passionate about illustrations, for example, will always underperform at corporate designs compared to their colourful, maybe whimsical sites they usually create. It's common sense. So gain experience by doing lots of projects when you first get into this business. Explore all categories, then choose one that suits you. Next, only take on projects in that field until you, quote-unquote, master it. Considering you may have some experience, you should ask yourself, what's your current goal? Is it to create an impressive portfolio in order to land a job at a big design agency? Is it to gain enough cash to go on a vacation or start a savings account? Or do you just want to pay the bills and keep the lights on? Depending on your answer and your personality, you have mainly two choices. One, work on big projects that are at least a few thousand dollars each, or grind through five to eight hundred dollar projects. At this point, considering my experience, my bank account, my personality, my current health and lifestyle, I'd probably work only on large projects. From time to time, I may resort to a relatively cheap project just for the fun of it. If you need to keep the lights on, grinding is the best way to go. 
because large projects usually require lots of custom graphic work which can't be easily adapted and reused anywhere else. When you're on the grind in the corporate website sector in a budget range of 500 to 1200, you can reuse the same techniques, color schemes, fonts and layouts and still keep things as original as they can be in this field. This doesn't mean you should continue reusing designs or elements from them if you're not getting good results. But if you're constantly getting good feedback and it's neck and neck between you and another freelancer, then this is the way to go. Before I end this section, I'd like to point out that I never work, not now nor in the past, for anything under $475. That includes a home page and maybe a generic page that can be used as a template for the rest of the pages. If you go underneath that price point, it just doesn't make sense anymore. It's the same work, the same effort, the same stress, you're just getting paid less. If the client really doesn't have the right budget, then move on. Really, just move on. Don't lower your standards because soon enough you'll be making $20 Facebook banners and that is not what it's all about. Going back to big projects, I'd suggest you move your way up gradually to them. Before you do anything major, you need a solid portfolio. You need to be able to keep your head high amongst tough competition no matter what. So for that, you'll need a big and vast portfolio. Big meaning at least 10 corporate websites, 10 creative ones, 10 minimalistic ones, etc. Vast meaning you should also feature other things like logo design, icon or banner design, and other things somewhat related to this field of web design. This will show the client you're the right person for the job. Okay, that's my take on how you should select your project. I know it's not a clear-cut answer, it's more about using your common sense, but this really is the best way. Consider your experience, your lifestyle, your bank account, your current job situation, and your perspectives, and then decide which of the two main routes is best for you. Pricing guide for your work. Ah, the great dilemma almost every freelancer faces. How much should I charge for my freelancing work? Should I go for a fixed price or calculate an hourly rate? What if the client wants to negotiate? These types of questions can cause major headaches and learning the best practices isn't always easy. But look no further, we're going to discuss the answers to your questions. First, calculate your living costs. Before looking at income, it's important to track your monthly expenses so you know what you should strive to earn at a minimum. There are lots of online calculators that track your expenses, even mobile apps, but a simple notepad can achieve the same results. First, list everything you can think of and be sure to revise your expenses as they change. That means rent, car insurance, gas, groceries, household bills, Adobe subscription and anything else that's significant. Then add all your expenses together and you'll have a good idea of your minimum goal per month. Of course, you can always break down your monthly goal into a weekly goal by dividing it by 4. Or figure out your yearly minimum by multiplying it by 12. Okay, now you have a minimum goal set up. Let's talk about your options when working on projects. 1. Charging per project. First, the advantages. It's easy to understand for the customer, time tracking isn't necessary, it simplifies your calculations, and it allows you to take on multiple projects at once. If you work and complete projects fast, your quotes seem much more reasonable than if you were to translate them into an hourly rate. For example, I can create a magnificent homepage in less than two hours if I'm in the right mood. If I charge $1,000, which isn't a huge amount by any means, that would translate into an hourly rate of $500 per hour. That's silly considering the general price ranges from $25 to $55 per hour. But then you may ask yourself, why do I charge so much? And just in case your client raises that question too, you can tell him he's paying for the end product and for your expertise. It's not about how many hours you sweat over a design, it's about how great the design looks. The amount of work, training and education that's behind the design that allows you to work at a high pace is what justifies the price. I'm very confident my work will boost sales and business, so I have no second thoughts about my asking prices. Now the drawbacks. Difficult customers might use this to their advantage to get you to do more work. Expect an increase in the duration of your projects. Expect a demand for multiple revisions and or drafts. Timeframes are very unreliable. It requires a strong grip on the customer relationship. Let's see an example of some number crunching on a per project basis. Minimum quote per project, $500. Living expenses per year, $1,000 times 12 is 
Minimum projects per year, 24. Minimum projects per month, 2. This is just a rough example with random numbers. Once you apply accurate real-world calculations, you'll end up with a nice figure to help you track your income versus your expenses. Unforeseen additional work. Work that wasn't included in the original brief is something that's requested from time to time and it's important to know how to manage it. Make sure you always quote exactly what the client expects to see in the final deliverables. For example, if you're working on a web design project, then include the exact number of pages and the exact features that will be included. Things like pop-ups, forms, logos, intermediate pages may not be included in the client's original brief, and it's up to you to foresee these additional features and address them before you start working. It's important to fully understand the project before you set a quote. It's okay to ask for additional information to ensure you know what the client is expecting. A typical quote would be something like this. Price for one home page plus one services page, as seen in the wireframes, means $1,500, excluding any transfer fees, 30% up front. I provide unlimited revisions, but all with common sense. The first home page draft will be ready in 48 hours. After each page is approved, you will make the payment, and then you will receive the layered PSD file, well organized and labeled, ready to be sliced and coded. You will also receive any custom fonts I may have used. Stock images are not included in the price. After approval, I will provide several options for you to purchase them. Until the final designs, you will see stock images that are not yet bought, so they will have watermarks on them. Those are for the site's protection and can't be removed. If you have any questions, please let me know. As soon as you make the initial payment, I will get started. Payment can be made via PayPal or wire transfer. And here I'd give out all my payment information. So as you can see, things are clear in writing without parts that are overly complicated. In case things go south, you can always refer back to this email. Now let's take a look at the second option, charging per hour. The advantages. Generally, clients use your time more wisely. You have a more relaxed approach on your projects. It cuts down on the number of revisions. Time frames are usually more reliable. Additional tasks not included in the initial brief aren't a big deal. The drawbacks. It requires time tracking and a reliable way to let your client know how much you're actually working. Limits your ability to juggle multiple projects. Requires strict living expense calculations. Seems less trustful to smaller clients who may not believe your number of hours quoted. Here's an example of calculations on a per hour basis. 365 days, minus 104 weekends, minus 14 holidays, minus 7 sick days, equals 240 working days in a year. 8 hours per day times 240 equals 1,920 maximum billable hours in a year. Let's say you're working on projects a conservative 40% of that time. 1920 times 0 0.4 is 768 billable hours. Living expenses per year, $1,000 times 12 is $12,000. Minimum hourly rate, 12,000 divided by 768 is $15.60 per hour. Again, this is a rough example with random numbers, but it can help you when you apply accurate real-world calculations. In general, you can expect to see quotes starting from $15 per hour all the way up to $55. In some cases, it can be more, but usually that's the standard interval. Additional work doesn't really harm you when you're working on an hourly rate. You might actually welcome it. It might have an impact on your scheduling, yet additional work is great news if your calculations are on point. A word of advice, always be sure you write every additional request down. Next, we'll talk about handling negotiations. You should always set your quote at the beginning of a project, never at the end. Though that seems super common sense, some people still don't follow it. From my personal experience, negotiating has its place in a lot of situations, but not in freelancing. It's important to portray a trustworthy image by being transparent and quoting fair prices. You should be able to deconstruct your quote based on your assessment of the project, your skill level, the deadline, etc. And if the client still isn't happy, then they're not the right person for you. You're not selling second-hand cars, so you don't need to strike deals or bargains with the client. You should be a professional that's asking for a fair price, no exceptions. 
Next on the list is protecting your work. That's a tricky situation, but let's take it step by step. First of all, you can use a contract. It should be simple and brief, otherwise your clients might be intimidated by it. But unless it's a 20-page novel, you have nothing to worry about. There are several guides and examples of contracts used for web design, and I'll include links to them so you can check them out. If you're in it for the long run, a contract lowers the chances of getting ripped off. And how can that happen? For starters, if you send over the original source files, the PSDs, before you get paid, then you're risking it. Never ever release the PSD file, no matter what the client tells you. Things like, my coder has to check if it's layered and organized, or I might want to do some final edits. Cut all this talk down by reminding your client that you will help out in case the coder has issues with the PSD. This includes guiding him through the folders in the PSD, creating elements you might have missed like drop-downs or hover states, but that doesn't mean doing extra things that weren't in the brief. Besides not releasing the project source files, you might want to watermark your JPEGs when you send them to your client. It's not ideal because it's a bit annoying. Here's an example of how a watermark design should look. Make sure your text opacity is really low. Alternatively, you can use all sorts of patterns, but I prefer to have my name and contact information in clear. Why would you do this? Well, if you send high-quality PNG files, an experienced coder can recreate your site with 60 to 90% accuracy depending on his skill and your design. It's a horrible thing to experience. Even if you watermark your design and you have a contract, you're still not 100% safe. I've seen clients hire third-world designers for $50 to recreate a design in Photoshop based on watermarked images. It's a real shame when that happens. I had a case like this, but upon seeing the watermark, I said no, as you should too. We should look out for each other even if we don't have a personal relationship. So in essence, yes, anybody that sets his mind to it can steal your design, or at least your layout, colour scheme, design ideas, and so on. If you think that's bad, imagine how I feel when my course gets torrented after I've worked seven months on it. Anyway, let's sum this part up. Don't release your source files before you get paid. Get a contract and watermark your drafts. In conclusion to the whole lecture, it's really up to you whether you'd like to charge by project or by an hourly rate. What's really important is to track your living expenses accurately and adjust your calculations accordingly. My personal recommendation is to keep a fair and transparent price at all times, avoid any negotiations and charge by the project since it's easier for the client to accept your quote. It also allows you to multitask among several projects and that will help you in your quest for speed. How to constantly get better Getting better as a web designer is done through both a process and hallelujah moments. I'll talk about the second part to get started. Hallelujah moments happen when you discover a course like this one and you hear some great information for the first time. It might be a new Photoshop technique or a new feature or just a new perspective on things. Those trigger an aha moment and from then on you never make the mistake of going back to your old habits. You discover something new and you implement it into your workflow. These are great experiences and I love them to death. It's similar to when you listen to a song for years and years and after all that time you finally understand what one verse is saying, or you get an inside joke after a long time. So how do you get your fix? It's not like world-class designers are sharing their secrets every day, right? Well, here's the thing, and this brings me back to the first part, the process of getting better. Designers actually are sharing their wisdom. The problem is that A, you don't read their articles, and B, they dilute their information. Let's start with the second part again. There's loads of web design blogs and magazines out there. I mean truly great stuff like smashingmagazine.com, designtutsplus.com, webdesignerdepot.com, and that's just to name a few. These have precious information almost every day. But now the problem. You need to work. You need to put those long hours in to get the job done, the job you already have. Whether it's on a crowdsourcing website, a design agency, freelancing by yourself, etc., then you have to improve your custom graphic making skills. Then you have to learn about other stuff like Illustrator, Muse, Edge Reflow and lots of other things. And then you have to go through loads of articles on several sites. Yes, it's a huge challenge and it takes time. But this is why it's a process. It's like going to the gym. It's like being on a diet. Results take time. And in most cases, you don't realize your progress unless you put the work in day in, day out for a long period of time. 
and even then results may fall short, so what do you do? You continue the journey, adding another week and yet another week. This is how you get great at this craft. This sums up point A, because you don't have enough time left in the day, you don't read up all those bits and pieces of information out there. To further increase the difficulty, you also have to go through lots of filler material and straight up BS. Like I said, the content is diluted or stretched. This isn't a rule, of course, I'm sure there are people out there that give it their all. I'm saying there's very little concentrated doses of knowledge web design wise. It's more a matter of getting small, diluted doses of information and putting them all together in order to get my hallelujah moment. And let me tell you, it's not as fun. This is why I put a lot of value on my approach. I tell you to maximize your layers panel real estate because I have no doubt that's the best way to work. Those articles don't tell you that specifically. They might give you small hints about it here and there, and then, based on your own experience, you finally discover it. That's what I mean by diluted information. You go through it, and as time goes by, you put it all together and something clicks. And there you go, another hallelujah moment. That's my personal view on things. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope you'll have a different experience to me. But in case you find yourself in the same situation, know that this is all we have. If you find a website that gives you amazing content in a direct form, hit me up with an email or share it with your fellow students. But what you'll probably find out is that most designers tend to keep their best techniques to themselves and they don't like to share their entire workflow. They might give you bits and pieces, but the hard part is to put it all together. So again, it's a process and it's the only way to constantly get better. As you may have noticed, I haven't said you should work hard, work a lot and work intelligently. That's because it's implied. Those are the basics you should be doing day in, day out. It's easier to say than do, yes, but that's the truth. So if you simply grind away site after site and don't go through these articles, you'll be outdated in no time. By watching this tutorial, you're pushing yourself further, but you have to continue. This can't be the course to end all courses. This can't substitute thousands of articles written by hundreds of talented web designers out there. So I can't stress this enough. You have to read up constantly in order to get better. Here's a list of my favorite websites, but be sure there are others out there. Make sure you read them. And yes, some of these publish articles that have very little to do with web design in Photoshop, but you have to dig for the right information. Good luck and remember this is one of the most important things you have to get out of this entire course. Getting better is a process accompanied by some hallelujah moments that requires constant effort to find relevant information that will help you further develop your skill. Best sources for fonts. Quite a few years ago, if you mentioned typography to a web designer, you'd mainly talk about Helvetica. Everybody loved it and all my clients asked for it. It was the custom go-to font. Besides it, we had the standard Arial, Times New Roman, Georgia, and maybe in rare cases, Impact. The other standard fonts were absolutely horrible. Comic Sans, Korea New, MS Serif, Tahoma. These just couldn't be used in a serious design. For a lemonade stand, sure. But for a more refined approach, we had to scratch our heads about costs, integration, and implementation. It just wasn't as easy as we have it today. Now, things are smooth as they can be. We have lots of free options, thousands to choose from, and the premium ones aren't that expensive. Google Web Fonts has sealed the deal with their extensive font gallery and one line of code integration, making the standard font list less and less used. So let's break it down into smaller pieces. Regarding Google Web Fonts, you can go to google.com fonts and you'll have this screen show up. We have over 650 font families here, and if you know what you're looking for, you can use the search field in the top left. Say we're looking for Open Sans. There it is. This moves us on to the next thing, font weights. This refers to the font's thickness. Most fonts have at least three states, light, normal, and bold. Some font families, including Open Sans, have other options like semi-bold italic 600 or extra bold 800. In general, the more weights, the better. This means you don't have to mix and match several typefaces in your design. Why would you do that? Well, if you use a font family that has only one weight, say normal, that's bound not to work everywhere. You'll need it for headlines, for paragraphs, for quotes, and so on. Normal isn't going to be flexible enough. So whenever possible, try and use a font family that offers several weights. 
OK, now we have our eye on this font family, but is it the right one for the job? Use the preview up top and paste in your words. In our case, let's say we want to use it for our main menu. Paste the items in and see how they look. OK, we're happy with it. How do we use it? First, we need to click the Add to Collection button. Then we're going to click in the top right of the screen on this little icon. This is sometimes hard to find for beginners. When the dialog appears, click on the first option, Download the font families in your collection as a zip file, and you'll get an archive. Save it onto your desktop, extract it, and paste the contents into C colon backslash windows backslash fonts, or where your operating system has its fonts. It's best to restart Photoshop, but it's not absolutely needed. You can type the name of the font and it'll show up. This is the standard way of doing it for all versions, but now with the Creative Cloud Typekit feature, we can easily get them super fast through the web. First, make sure you're logged in with your Adobe ID on typekit.com and use the menu to narrow down your font choices. After you're happy, click on Use Font and then Sync Selected Fonts. A new button will appear asking you to launch the Creative Cloud application. This is needed in order to synchronize your downloads with your computer. I've had some bugs in the past where this feature didn't work, but after you restart the Creative Cloud program, you should be fine. Then head over to the Assets tab, Fonts, and here you'll see what you've downloaded. An amazing feature, but since not everybody has a Creative Cloud subscription, we'll stick to Google Fonts the old fashioned way. Regarding font categorization, let's talk about serif and sans serif fonts. The easiest way to understand the differences between them is to look at these columns. On the left, we have sans serif fonts, and on the right, we have serif fonts. As you see, the sans serif ones are cleaner and are generally considered more modern. The serif fonts have these small decorations or details, so it's very easy to spot the difference. Another thing to remember is that sans means without, so sans serif means without decorations. In general, I tend to use sans serif fonts because they have a premium look to them. It's far more common to have them in tech oriented websites. Sans serif is what I'd call a safe choice, but without any negative connotations attached to it. So when in doubt, use a sans serif font. Serif fonts are far more elegant and they work wonders in the right hands. They're great in vintage sites, in upscale, luxurious company websites, and even in blogs. Nowadays, I'd say serif fonts have become a minority, but they're a fine choice for a modern company who wants to mix and match fonts, as you'll see a bit later on. OK, that's serif and sans serif, but you'll probably see other categorizations too. Let's go through them. Script refers to a handwritten font, very elegant, usually calligraphic. Here you can see some nice examples of them. It's not a rule it should be handwritten, but due to its flowing nature, most people associate it with that. Handwritten can be a category in itself, and it's usually more messy, less elegant, exactly like our own writing. This is great for certain projects where you want to achieve a particular effect. Decorative fonts are usually intricate and or irregular fonts. These are less used in web design, but you might want to use certain symbols like the ampersand to get a nice distinctive feeling. They don't have to be crazy though. Museo Slab, for example, is considered by Typekit a decorative font. Black letter refers to Gothic script, or as some of you may call it, Old English. It's very rare to see it in a modern website. Its uses are thus limited to very specific designs, so unless you're designing a pirate website, you'd best stay away. Monospace fonts have the same width in all letters. This makes them quite pleasing to look at, and they can be both serif and sans serif. And that's about it regarding their classification. I'd say you stick with the three main categories, sans serif, serif, and script, because those are the most useful in our work. One thing to note about fonts is that you shouldn't fill up your computer with 50,000 fonts you may find on torrent sites or whatever places on the web. The problem with large libraries of fonts is that you simply can't use them all. First of all, you require a preview since you can't use a font without knowing how it looks. Going through Photoshop's font preview feature isn't going to cut it. You can't simply choose a font at random either. Your decision must be based on a certain style you have in mind. Secondly, it really slows down your computer when you jam-pack it with tens of thousands of fonts. 
But speaking about the font's appearance, I have to mention that there are third-party programs that let you see how they look, but from my experience they're not a go-to choice anymore. Google Web Fonts and Adobe's Typekit are far more convenient. For Google Web Fonts, you should download them all if your system allows it. If you browse around on the internet, you'll have an archive that contains them all. While in that folder, search for TTF and you'll have the entire list of fonts appear. We currently have around 650 font families, which is quite a lot, but these are the ones you'll most likely use throughout the first years of web designing. If you think your system can't handle it, just download them one by one as you need them. But if you install them all, forget about them and carry on. When it's time to look up a font, use Google Fonts to search through their library, use the preview up top to see how your text will look. Once you've decided, you can jump back into Photoshop and use it. This spares us the trouble of having to download them individually and moving them to our fonts folder. Again, I'm speaking for those who don't have Typekit. If you're a Creative Cloud subscriber, you won't have to deal with any of these steps, but it's really your choice. Both platforms offer more than sufficient fonts. So that's the main categorization of fonts and the best sources to get them. Let's continue. The Character Panel This is a must-have in your side panel. To show it, go to Window, Character. Let's take it step by step and explain things. We'll hurry along since you probably know most of these. The first field is Font Family. Pretty straightforward, it tells you what font you're using. On the right of it, we have our font weight. Photoshop calls it font style. Here you can expect to find quite a few. Just in case we don't have any options, we can use a trick, though it's not web safe and I don't recommend it. That's faux bold and faux italic. That's French for fake. This makes the font look like it actually has other weights, but keep in mind this can't be implemented when you want the site to go live. I may use these features when I want to present my design in a hurry and I want to cut corners. Moving on to the font size, I like to type in my value manually, and I've gotten used to using pixels instead of points. That's what I recommend you use as well. Points are used in the printing industry, and those who recommend them usually come from that background. There's another thing people are recommending nowadays, and that's using EM, which is a relative measurement. If you're using 12 pixels, that's static, it doesn't change. EM switches things up. If your body text is sized at 12 pixels, and you set your subheadline at 1.2 EM or 120%, that means the font is going to be 1.2 times 12, meaning 14.4 pixels. This is useful when you want to change every CSS class easily. Simply change the default size and everything will be subsequently impacted. This is a nice feature considering we have lots of various sized phones, tablets, laptops and monitors. EM helps you get the right size by working more efficiently. So to sum it up, by using EMs you can scale your fonts quite easily and this translates into better management through CSS. That's not the point of this course, but I thought I should present it too. EM is not an option you have in Photoshop, so pixels it is, and if you want to learn more about this subject, feel free to research it. Most web design courses that discuss coding should include this subject. Going back to Photoshop, when I want to browse around fast between sizes, I click once and then I use my mouse scroll wheel to go through several sizes. You can also rapidly increase or decrease the size by clicking and holding on this icon. For me, this next preference is really important. Whenever you want to make changes to your text layer, I recommend you do so by using the character panel. That means if you want to change the size, the color, absolutely anything, simply select your text layer from your layers panel and then use the character panel. You may ask, what's the alternative? Well, I've seen lots of designers do the following. They select the type tool, then they select the entire text layer, whether it's one word or an entire paragraph, and then they change its appearance from above. That's not efficient in my book, but moreover, it's quite confusing. Why waste time by performing a useless step? Not to mention, if you have the text selected and you're changing its weight, for example, you won't get to see the change accurately. You have to first deselect and then continue. This varies depending on your Photoshop version. Another thing regarding using the character panel is that when you're done making changes, you simply press enter. You don't have to select another tool or do anything like that. The confusion comes from doing this. You select the entire layer. You make some changes from up above because most likely you're clueless about the existence of the character panel, and then, well, you're stuck. Some people go up top to click on this check mark, which I've probably used no more than five times in my life, 
or how most people do it, they go all the way over to the Tools panel and they select the Move tool. Obviously, they can't press V because that will make the letter show up in the text layer. I know, I come across a bit harsh. We should respect everyone's opinion, decisions and workflow. Yet when I see Photoshop instructors do these things, I lose my mind. I know I still have lots to learn and hey, maybe some of my preferences are wrong. But some things are simply objective. OK, sorry about that. Back to this panel. Underneath the font size, we have kerning. Not a very interesting feature for us, but I should mention it. You have two main options, metrics, which is the standard, and optical. Kerning controls how certain pairs of letters are spaced out. Metrics is the default setting, the way the font was intended to be spaced out. You can see an example here. Underneath, we have set it to optical, and the differences are ever so slightly there. This varies a lot from font to font, from letter to letter. If we zoom in a lot on the word kerning, we can see with the metric setting that there's some empty space between the K and the E. Underneath, there's no space at all. The E is actually pushing into the K. So the optical setting adjusts the spacing between the letters based on their shapes. You can also manually adjust that, but I don't recommend it. It's an interesting idea, and I'm sure typography lovers have a place in their heart for this option. For our web design work, this isn't something very useful. To the right of kerning, we have a feature called tracking, but I like to call it by its CSS name, letter spacing. This controls the overall space for the group of letters or entire paragraphs. This is something we will use from time to time because it gives us lots of options regarding our headlines. It's quite easy to use and you can clearly see the advantages of it when we increase tracking to 10. This increases the space between our letters and thus it gives it a more airy feel. This improves readability and aesthetics in most cases. You can also go the other way around and squeeze the text in. Minus 20 is a good example. The results aren't dramatic, but that's exactly what we want. You'll see some examples a bit later on, but know that this works great for both headlines and buttons. It obviously isn't great for paragraphs of text. I'd also like to point out that even though this performs similarly to letter spacing in CSS, they don't match scale to scale. So the value of 10 that we previously put in doesn't translate into 10 pixels letter spacing, nor 1 pixel in case you were wondering. It actually requires a conversion to EMs that I previously mentioned. I wouldn't worry about it too much because this is more towards the coding side of things. But just in case you were wondering, I found a formula that claims to translate tracking into letter spacing accurately. It goes like this. Photoshop letter spacing times font size divided by 1000 equals CSS letter spacing. Everything is in pixels. I've tried it and it does seem to work, though I'm not sure this is the golden standard that this is how senior developers do it. Anyway, I thought I should mention it. Next to the font size, we have leading, which is called line height in CSS. This controls the amount of space between lines of text, thus the name. It's great for improving readability and we'll talk more about it in a future lecture. OK, moving on, we have two other controls here that control the vertical and horizontal scaling. They're extremely easy to understand. Simply double the percentage and you'll see the results. 200% vertically gives you this appearance. While 200% horizontally gets you this one. Not really helpful in our work, so I suggest you skip it. The same goes for the baseline shift controller, which moves your text up and down. This helps when you have something like second written. You select the ND and use the baseline shift to move it up. With some fonts, you'd much rather use the designated command from underneath, but that's the function. This is another thing we won't use. To finish up this character panel, we'll zoom through these options in this region. We have a bit of text and we're simply going to observe what's happening. Fake bold and fake italic is pretty obvious. Like I previously mentioned, don't use these since it won't translate well into the real design. The all caps function is great and I like to use it even when I know I want all caps. So instead of writing menu, I'd much rather write menu and then use this feature. Why? Because if the client doesn't like it, it's easier for me to revert to the normal mode than to retype every title in the site. Small caps make the first letter stand out a bit while keeping everything in upper casing, though smaller than usual. Pretty much useless. Superscript helps us for cases like this. We select ST, we press the button, and there you go. 
Subscript works for cases like this, where the 2 has to shift its baseline. Pretty easy to get. Underline is something you should stay away from completely. It's a major pitfall and you don't want to fall into it. I know 5 to 10 years ago every link was underlined, but things have drastically changed over time. Underlines are really out of style and strike through. I can't see its point in any setting. So we've blown through half of these, let's jump into the other half. All these settings vary from font to font. Some have more than others, but you need to stick to open type fonts. Besides that, you need to look for pro versions because those have the most features built in. These might be helpful in rare occasions in some stylish H2, H3 paragraphs where you want to stylize a quote, for example. Let's press on each of the buttons and notice what happens. I have two lines here in two different fonts, so we can observe most of these features. In our first line, standard ligatures change our capital T, but also FFI in Office and FFL in Waffles. So it recognizes combinations of letters that can be stylized in a different way, and it does just that. Looking at the second example, we can see how the O in Office ties in nicely with the F. This adds a bit of elegance to our type and makes it that much more interesting. Remember the details make the difference. The second button, Contextual Alternates, isn't available for our first line, but it works on the second one. When we take a closer look, we can see the IS has been changed alongside other bits and pieces like ST in last. This gives us the impression of a handwritten font orientated more towards calligraphy. Moving along to discretionary ligatures, although this is available, it doesn't affect our second line of text. Instead, it replaces ST and CT in our first line with something a bit more detailed. The swash, again, only works on the second line, but it does a great job enhancing the first letter. The capital T is far more attractive with this feature turned on. Stylistic alternates curve the W and Y in our first line of text. It has no effect on our script font, though. Titling alternatives is not available on any of these two lines. It works on all capital letters to format them. Ordinal works for first, and fractions works on the half symbol. So you get the idea of these features. They enhance our typography. Do clients notice these little things? Not really. And moreover, it's quite hard to find a font with all these features that still fits your requirements. It's hard enough finding a good font for general uses, but when you throw these into the mix, you're complicating yourself a lot. Don't get me wrong, they bring loads of value for the high to ultra high level designer. Yet in most circumstances, in 90% of the projects you're going to be working on, you won't use these too much. Okay, one last thing before we move on. Adjacent to the character panel, we have the paragraph tab. Here, we're interested in disabling hyphenation. That simply means we won't have words that are broken down into two because they don't fit. It's not aesthetically pleasing, so we're going to uncheck that. How to identify a font. When browsing through inspiration, you might be struck by an amazing combination of fonts that blows your socks off. A gray that works so well on a thin sans serif font you'd die for. How do you borrow them for your own work? Well, you probably know about this function most browsers have, but I'll run you through it just in case you might have skipped that lesson. First, open up an amazing looking website. I'll take a look at designnova.net, which is stunning in my book. So let's start off with the headline. I'm using Firefox because I don't trust Google Chrome's privacy, but that's another subject, and I'll right click on the text and hit inspect element. This will bring up this panel underneath. We can then select the Fonts tab, and there you go, you have all the information here. We can then go down underneath the Hero area and use the same principle. Montserrat is the font of choice, and it looks amazing. The thing is, not everything about the font is shown here. To get the full picture, we're going to go to Rules. Scroll down a bit, and now we're getting the complete picture. If you don't know CSS, don't panic, this isn't anything crazy, it's actually quite simple. Font size is 16 pixels, but we had that already. Line height is 28, and that's really important. In Photoshop, that's called leading, as I may have mentioned earlier, and it's controlled from here. This sets the distances between lines, and as you see, if I change it to a lower value, the design loses quite a lot of style points. This is why you should always stay away from the auto setting in Photoshop. Moving on, we get to see the font family and font weight. Here, don't expect to see things like bold or thin, because we usually get a value like this, 
300, but it's fairly easy to find that weight in Photoshop, so no worries there. Lastly, we have letter spacing set to 6 pixels. This makes the text breathe quite a lot, and it looks fantastic in this all uppercase format. Letter spacing translates into tracking in Photoshop, and converting one into the other isn't an easy thing to do because it relies on that EM measurement I mentioned earlier. Lastly, we'll want to see what color was used here, but for that we're going to have to scroll up a bit. And as you can see, it's pure black. In some cases, you might see very particular codes for dark grays. The easiest ones are 333 or 555, but there are other ones that give a certain look. The differences are subtle, but they're there. Notice I didn't say 333333, which would be the complete code in the format Photoshop uses. I only said 333, and that's because when the hex code has the same digit all across, you can type in only the first three characters, and the right color will show up. So that's how you use your browser to identify a font. I'd like to point out that in this particular website, we easily saw the font size value. It was 16 pixels. If that was 1.2 EM, we would have had to dig deeper in order to find out the actual value. So while EM is great for scaling fonts in order to adjust for different displays, or different zoom levels, it's not so great for people who are looking to inspect your design, and in this case, that's us. But say the font isn't selectable and thus the browser inspector doesn't yield any results. Or maybe it gives incomplete information. What should you do in that case? Well, there's this great community over at myfonts.com and they're amazing. Simply write into Google what the font and the first results will lead you there. On this website, you can load in your image with a font you want to identify. The image must be very clean and it shouldn't contain anything else other than the font. Ideally, all letters should be well spaced out and the image should contain very distinct letters so the software doesn't confuse them. After you press continue, the site will automatically try to match each letter. If it doesn't get it right, you should change the value underneath, and for the empty boxes, you should fill them out, because that means there are letters that weren't recognized. Finally, hit continue and you'll have a list of similar fonts. The accuracy varies depending on your image, but just in case you don't find the exact one, you can submit a case to their forum. You have to sign up first, but that's free. Then ask for help in a detailed fashion, and you'll be surprised at how fast people will jump in to try and help you. I've had 100% accurate responses in under an hour, but of course that varies quite a lot. They also have this specify image URL, but it's basically the same thing. You just skip a step by not saving the image because you get its link instead. That wraps it up. That's three ways in which you can identify a font. By doing so, you're heading in the right way of improving your typography game. The more you use fonts, the better you'll get at it. Mixing fonts. Mixing fonts might seem like an easy thing to do, but it actually requires an understanding of several rules. In general, experienced designers tend to recommend you stay away from using too many colors or fonts in your projects. The reason behind this is simple. It's very easy to get it wrong. So to be on the safe side, you should stay away. The easy classic version is to choose a font family that has several weights. Fonts like Roboto, which is the official font for the current Android version, are a great choice. Since it offers so many options like thin, light, regular, italic, medium, bold, black, condensed and slab versions, you can use it throughout your design, no matter what. This has little or no downsides. Of course, if you mix a few fonts carefully, you might get a much better result, more impact. You'll get a design that looks very well thought out with a high attention to detail. On the other hand, if you get it wrong, you're bound to bring the whole design down. So think very carefully before you go down this road. It's not heroin, don't get me wrong, it's not something you should fear, yet you should be aware of your own current skill level. So if you have a big, important project you need to get done fast and clean, maybe you should pick another day to try this technique out. Okay, so that's about it regarding the warnings. I hope you got the idea. Mix fonts in less important projects, so in case you mess up, it won't have a big impact on you. The number one rule is less is more. Typography has a major role in web design, and this is why we're speaking so much about it. Yet don't try to compensate for your lack of refinement, technique, or attention to detail through font usage. It's easy to get carried away, so to keep ourselves down to earth, we'll always revert back to the idea that less is more. That translates into using only two font families in one design. Will the sky fall on you if you use three? Of course not, but that's a general guideline. 
As your experience grows, so will your refinement and decision making. The second thing to consider is using different fonts. The key word here is different. The idea is this. If something is not clearly outlined, then it might look like a mistake. You might have come across a situation where you had to explain your decisions from your canvas in order to get the point across. If that needs to happen, then it's on you. It's a mistake. That means that using similar fonts might not come across as a design technique, but instead it might be viewed as a mistake. Take a look at this example to see my point. For the untrained eye, these might seem like the same font, but if you look closely, you'll see the differences are quite clear. One is Arial Regular, while the other is Lato Regular. Imagine this font in a heading and subheading. You really couldn't tell the difference. This sends a signal of something's not right, the design feels off. And because your client is not a typography expert, most likely he won't be able to properly explain the problem. That gets you in a world of trouble. So the main point here is to use distinctive fonts. You don't have to get crazy with it though, don't mix Old English with Arial just to get the point across. Instead, try and use simple combinations of serif and sans serif fonts. Here I've prepared a few samples for you just in case you were wondering. As you can clearly see, everything is pretty much clear, there's no doubt I'm mixing fonts. If you'd like to explore each font combination in particular, feel free to open up the PSD file that's attached to the course. They aren't intricate and highly detailed, but they're good. The difference between good and great font mixing comes in the details. Throw in a bit of texture, use oversized fonts, combine super bold ones with ultra thin ones. How about some special characters? These are some of the things that set you apart. OK, moving on to visual hierarchy. There should be no doubt about what's the headline, the subheadline and the body. Use fonts to better illustrate that. In general, as you know, headlines have to significantly stand out. This is a good opportunity to use a thicker, heavier font. The subheading might be smaller, but it still has to distinguish itself from your paragraph text. It's all about a balance you need to achieve through your font usage. Here I chose a different weight, font size and colour, so I've used the full arsenal. Underneath we have two paragraphs of text. Again, they have their own clear formatting, very different from the rest. This is what you're aiming for. Also, regarding mixing fonts, I'd say you should consider the context of your design. If it's a kid's website, you should probably stay away from fonts that are too serious. Lots of fonts have a personality. They transmit a feeling through their appearance that has to be taken into consideration. That's a difficult thing to do in the beginning, especially if you're too close to the board, so to speak, meaning you should always take a step back from your design. Use Control-0 to zoom out and think about the atmosphere you're trying to create. It's not a coincidence that most app companies use sans-serif, crisp, clean fonts. Nor is it the fact that design agencies tend to express their own personality through highly impactful typography. These choices make sense because they're appropriate and in line with the message they're trying to get across. So those are my thoughts regarding mixing fonts. I recommend you start off easy by simply combining different weights from the same font family. Besides that, adjust their size and colour and you'll be good to go. Typography tips, tricks and techniques. In this video, we're going to go through several typography tips, tricks and techniques that are web design focused. Without further ado, let's get started. Custom fonts are amazing because they can transform the way your website looks. A problem most designers face is going overboard with it. One of the most common mistakes is using a custom font for every text layer on the site, including the body text. This can give you a sub-par result because not all fonts are legible at small sizes. Arial, for example, works great in both big and small cases. It's actually the preferred choice for body text due to the fact that it's quite visible even all the way down to 11 pixels. In this case, I've set it on 12 and on sharp for the anti-aliasing. If we had a white background, I might have used 11 pixels. If we switch the font out with Lobster 1.4, you'll see this doesn't look right. Even if we increase the size a bit, we're still getting a mediocre result at best. Let's undo that. On the other hand, if we use the same font for the headline, due to its generous proportions, then it becomes much better. So always keep that in mind when you're browsing through font galleries. Your results will vary a lot depending on your choices, but don't make poor design decisions by hiding behind the fact that you want consistency in your website design. 
I'd love to show you more examples, but they're really useless because of the incredible number of fonts that are available out there. So do yourself a favor and take a second look before you move forward with your design. Remember, some fonts look good only in certain sizes. Speaking of Arial, this is still my number one choice when it comes down to body text. I find most clients like it because all end users are really accustomed to it. In web design, you don't have to innovate in every single place. If something's heavily used in the industry, you might just tag along for the ride. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Since this is a top choice for your body text, we'll spend a bit more time on it. First, regarding its size, I'd go no smaller than 11 and no bigger than 14 pixels. 11 is very close to the limit, but in some cases, especially in template designs, it looks very elegant and beautiful. If you use it in a color of 444 or even 555, it can give a subtle look which goes great alongside powerful imagery or custom graphics. Still, in general, I'd recommend you stick to 12 pixels. Line height is a critical factor in your paragraphs. Again, in Photoshop, it's called leading. But since the CSS equivalent is more descriptive and widely known, we're going to keep calling it line height. The magic formula here is your font size, obviously in pixels times 1.5. So if you're using 12 pixels, that means your minimum line height should be 18 pixels. This is more towards the safer side of things. For 12 pixels, I'd even use 22 if the site height allows me to. And since I'm the designer and I'm in control of the site height, 22 it is. Still, I recommend you start off with 1.5 and move your way up to 1.6, but no more than 1.7, which should be used sparingly. The problem you may end up with is that on a content-heavy website, these big line heights will take their toll on the site's length, meaning you'll end up with a long page which requires lots of scrolling, and your client might not like that. I've already mentioned a few color codes, 444 and 555. I use anything from 222 all the way to the dreaded 666, which has a notoriously bad rep because it's not very legible. Dark greys are the way to go, because a pure 000 black looks less refined. There's no real magic to it, just stick to a color code throughout your design. So don't mix 222 with 333 because that might come across as a mistake, like I previously mentioned in another video. Moving on to anti-aliasing, this simply refers to the transition between your layer and your background. So if you have black text on a white background, anti-aliasing introduces some grey pixels in order to smooth out the transition. The end result is a crisp font. There's no golden rule as far as I'm concerned, but I recommend you stick with either smooth or crisp. In most cases, these have given me the best results. When we toggle between them, you won't see any huge differences. It's all about subtlety. In particular cases where I'm using a small font size, I'll switch to either sharp or strong in order to get a better contrast. This is great for footers, for example, where I might want to go down to 11 or even 10 pixels in size, yet still maintain my text legibility. We have this example where we have a bit of text, 11 pixels white, on this background. On this smooth setting, it's not great at all. But once we switch over to either sharp or strong, things improve dramatically. So it's with these cases where you need to experiment, and it's only under these circumstances where I'd break consistency in the design. So smooth everywhere except in the footer or in other elements that have an inverted color scheme where I might use sharp. The newly introduced options, Windows and Windows LCD, which by the way have a Mac equivalent, aren't a top choice in my book, mainly because they don't look as good. Plus, they aren't 100% accurate. But more importantly, you lose points in your presentation department. I'd much rather use smooth or crisp to present my design to my client than with an uglier anti-aliasing method, even though that may be a bit more realistic. This is my own personal choice, so it's up to you if you want to switch over to these newly introduced anti-aliasing options. They claim it's the most accurate thing we'll get, yet again, I'm sticking to my guns on this, at least for the moment. Continuing, I'd like to talk about line width. It's generally a bad idea to have very wide text areas because they don't look as good. You already heard the expression wall of text. It's one of the worst things you can do to a website. The optimal number of characters you should have in a line is around 75. This is how that looks. To be fair, here we only have 71. Of course, you can't sit around all day using character counting software, so I recommend you look at this width and then eyeball it from now on. 
with time you'll get used to it. And in order to further improve the design of your paragraphs, you should always have no more than five to six lines of text before you start a new paragraph. By doing so, the text seems more manageable and users are far more likely to read it. This goes for smaller text. As the copy gets larger, you should limit yourself to two or three lines. This works great for subheadlines. Visually, it makes a big impact if your last line is over the middle point of the paragraph. So don't end it with only a few words on the last line because I find it doesn't look as good. That's obviously a personal preference, not a rule by any case. I don't recommend you hyphenate text simply because I don't think it looks good. There's a case for saying it makes the text fields blockier, thus having the same distances from your other content, yet visually I don't find it pleasing. Justifying text is a bit controversial. Simply left aligning it works best in 90% of the cases. Justifying left can work, and you can do so from the paragraph panel with this control. This makes the text significantly blockier, and some would argue neater. I say it's up to you. One thing to note is that by justifying left, we get these increased spaces, extremely visible to spot in this second paragraph. That's not very aesthetically pleasing, so for that reason we need to hyphenate. Note the spaces have toned down quite a lot, so it's your choice really, either left align no hyphenation, or justify left with hyphenation. One thing I'm strongly against is justify all. By enabling it, you can see what a mess it creates, so steer clear of it. How about centering the text? There's very few cases where this works well. The hero areas or maybe testimonial sections come to mind. You should limit it to only a few lines, otherwise things get out of control. The problem is that if you've used it somewhere underneath the hero area, then you've got to use it everywhere else. You can't apply this text formatting to only one paragraph and then leave the others left aligned. It looks awful. Okay, moving on. If you're in a place where you can't use any custom fonts, Arial has some nice tricks up its sleeve. Take Arial Black or Bold with a letter spacing of minus 60 and a size of 30 pixels and you've got yourself a nice headline. Make it all caps, drop the size to 14 and the letter spacing to minus 40 and you've got yourself a stylish main menu. Switch it up to narrow, 300 plus letter spacing, 30 pixel size, and you have some text specific to magazines or fashion websites. Revert back to Arial regular, 30 pixels, zero letter spacing, and change the last word to bold. Then change its color to a nice shade of yellow, and you have yourself a nice simple headline. Lastly about Arial, I've seen lots of third world designers, but not only them, using no anti-aliasing for their body text. They were probably using it in order to make the text less obvious, if that makes sense, more subtle, more refined. I recommend you use 11 pixels with 333 or 555 for that, but they were using no anti-aliasing because they were stuck in 2002, where 90% of Template Monster's designs appeared to have no anti-aliasing. To this day, if you Google something like web design template, you'll still find images that feature harsh text. You should stay away from that. This is one of those giveaways that you're dealing with someone who has no idea what they're doing. It's like wearing socks with sandals. You just can't pull it off. Here in this particular case, it's not that bad. I can almost hear some of you saying that. But this is an unlikely circumstance where I'm using a very saturated and powerful background color. 90% of the sites out there won't have that. We've already discussed the character panel, so I won't go into it again. Just remember to always use it instead of this top part here. Since some designers don't use it, when it comes down to resizing text layers, they'll use Control T to either enlarge or shrink their copy. Yes, text layers are vectors, so you can resize them without losing quality, yet if you resort to Control T, you'll end up with sizes like 31.14 pixels. That's not optimal, and it brings me to the next subject. I'm sure you may have heard of H1, H2, H3 if you've ever dealt with web design. That simply refers to headline 1, headline 2, and so on. That's a particular format you apply to your text. You may have seen it in any WordPress text editor. When we design anything, we should be consistent in our sizes. So if you've decided to use 45 pixels for H1, don't use 42 someplace else and 39 in another element. You should clearly make up your mind by assigning a specific style to each format. 
So H1 might be 40 pixels, H2 30, H3 20, H4 16, quotes 13 italic and so on. It's up to you, there's no set standard, yet they should be clearly set apart in order not to confuse them. Of course you can change their weight as well, you're not limited to size. Ideally, when you ship your PSDs, you should include a file that covers all of these typography references, so the coder will easily be able to implement your design. Chances are that if you don't do it, the coder might either forget or disregard your text formatting. Lastly, to finish this area up, I recommend you never use drop shadow for your body text. I've yet to see cases where that makes sense. For headlines, that's another thing, because subtle drop shadow can increase legibility, so that's quite welcomed. But for black or dark grey paragraph text on a white background, never. And oh, you should never rasterize your text layers. I've seen designers do this because they fear the client or coder might not have those fonts available on their system. If that's the case, simply give them a link to where they can get it. There's no reason why you should rasterize your text layers because then the coder can't see your formatting. So that's about it in this section. Good luck with your typography and remember to deliberately try to improve your mental database of fonts. Introduction and Project Description Welcome to this part of the course. Over the next videos, we'll put everything we've learned together into action. We're going to use all our knowledge to create an awesome website design. The goals here are A, for you to see how I really work in a real project, B, understand how and why I make certain decisions, and C, get a better understanding of all the principles we've previously discussed. I'd like to share a few thoughts before we jump into it, though. For time considerations, I will speed up the video from time to time in areas which I consider less important. So if you've seen me perform the same action five times, the sixth time might be sped up. This is so the entire course doesn't take up too much time. The idea here isn't for you to follow along step by step, it's more about understanding my workflow, my thought process and my decision making. So I don't recommend you try and follow along as we go. If you want to practice the techniques here, you can do so in a second viewing by constantly pausing. Okay, so now we've established that, there's only one thing left I'd like to mention. This isn't going to be the most amazing, intricate, highly detailed, custom, tailor-made design you'll ever see. It's going to be a very nice website design, yet for the same time considerations, I won't go crazy with things like custom graphics. That might take one to two hours by themselves to create and explain. So keep that in mind as you see the outcome unfold. Don't think I've sacrificed quality just to get the course out sooner, far from it. I'm confident the website will look great, but I thought I should mention I'm not aiming for my absolute best here. OK, with that being said, let's jump right into it. The project is going to be a randomly selected contest from 99designs. I thought this would be a better approach than simply creating something out of my mind, so it's going to be a real client with a real brief. The goal isn't going to be winning the contest. We'll do one design and that's it. Why so? Again, those pesky time restraints. It's very unusual to win a contest with the very first entry. It's far more common to submit two or four concepts and then loads of variations. Those take time, and if we're to follow that line, the course would take forever to complete, both for me, the author, and for you, the viewer. OK, the project has a first prize of nearly $2,000, and $350 extra will be split up between the finalists. If you don't know that system, don't worry about it, that's not important. This is the brief, that's what matters. The site's name is Power to Sing, and it's about someone who wants to teach singing lessons live through Skype and in online courses. Simple enough. He wants five pages, but will focus on the home page only. He says he wants a large banner, like in the examples he gave us, and a strong sense of brand and message. OK, we'll come back to that. Point B says he wants compelling and prominent opt-in. He also wants easy-to-find navigation into content. So before we go any further, let's dissect the brief so far. He's an individual who wants to teach other people how to sing, thus the name Power to Sing. Great. Point A means he wants a nice hero area. He calls it a banner, but the more appropriate term is what we're using. A banner usually means a box like 125 by 125 or 300 by 250 pixels. By saying he wants a sense of brand and message, I interpret that as two things. One, I should do a very distinctive colour scheme, nothing too out there, but certainly something that will represent him. Like T-Mobile uses magenta, like Orange uses orange, like Vodafone uses red and so on. That's the first point. 
Point two means I'll probably want to use images of himself. This is a one-man show, so a strong sense of brand and message means a big hero area with a nice picture of the teacher alongside a great headline. At least those are my thoughts so far. Point B regarding compelling and prominent opt-in simply means he wants very clear calls to action because he wants students as soon as possible. So we have to include a form or some kind of call to action buttons through the site. I'm not sure about C, easy to find navigation into content. We'll surely have a clear navigation, but probably he wants to go content heavy. So I'm guessing he wants some type of category widget or a secondary menu, probably somewhere in the left or right side and most likely displayed in a vertical manner. This is just me guessing, I have no idea if this is the case, but this is how you start up your design, based on calculated guesses. Going further down the brief, we see he wants to use a certain framework. That doesn't concern us too much. It's nice that he lists his objectives, that's going to help. One, build my email list is very standard. He wants to obtain leads to transform visitors into potential clients. Two, easy to find and access content means you shouldn't go crazy with super creative layouts. Three, simple, colorful, and friendly, means you should make a nice design. Four, spacious, open feeling, visual, engaging, means he wants an airy feel to the website, nothing too cluttered or too compact. Visual means he wants custom graphics and or images. Five, strong branding and message. We already talked about it. What to avoid? No auto starting video. Damn, that was a big thing I was aiming for in my initial design. Of course, I'm joking. The client doesn't clearly distinguish the design aspect from the coding side of things. I say this because really, even if I put a video in the hero area, that doesn't imply it automatically plays. No sliding banners means he wants a static hero area. Sure, no problem. No stock photos translates into no cheesy stock photos. And no flash. That's regarding the coding side of things again. Flash has been replaced by HTML5, and it's very unlikely you'll see new sites made with that old technology. All right, I have to mention that as I'm recording this video, some things have changed in the brief. The client updated it. He also posted a message on the public section of the contest, but again, that doesn't interest us too much because we're not here to follow along the contest. We're only here to use these details. And by the way, I have to mention I did ask the contest holder for his permission, and he gladly said yes, so I'm thankful for that. Great, so let's jump into these inspirational websites. TheSongbirdTree.com, this confirms a lot of the things I said by analyzing the brief. SuitcaseEntrepreneur.com, this features a parallax effect and it's pretty bold in its approach. This is a generic type of online business that sells a product, any product. Here, she's selling a business. What we need to get from that is that the site is geared towards converting, or at least it should be. MarieForLeo.com, this is similar to the first site we saw, but it has more of a blog feel to it. I personally wouldn't go down that road considering he wants to get as many students as possible, but we'll see. Blogmarketingacademy.com This is another site that wants to sell something. If you're sensing I'm not too fond of them, then you're correct. This particular one looks dated, far worse than Suitcase Entrepreneur, but I'm guessing it still converts pretty well since this site claims to teach you how to get more traffic and build a business. I'd scratch this off our list since there's nothing interesting to see here. JamesWedmore.com This is the same selling approach but in a better package. Overall, I'm questioning the contest holder's taste. It seems he really wants to sell, yet I don't believe these are excellent examples. I'd say these are pretty much generic, mediocre websites, way overused and full of cliches. But hey, that's just my opinion and that's going to be reflected in my design. This site has been listed twice by the client. Not sure if that's intentional. Probably not. TheSingingZone.com It's a terrible design, probably made in 2006. I'm guessing the client linked to it because it seems to operate in the same niche, teaching people how to sing. Everything here is tacky, cheesy and rough around the edges. To make matters worse, the site has the video set on autoplay, which is, in this time, one of the worst things you can do to your users. I'm not really interested in what the client has to say about this website. It's not going to be on my list. NewYorkVocalCoaching.com Yet another website where the video auto plays. Problem is, I can hear the video, but the video isn't actually playing. Overall, the design looks like it was done by a business owner and not by a professional designer. You can see glimpses of modern web design, nice ideas here and there, but the overall execution lacks refinement. Now I understand why the client mentioned he doesn't want a video that starts automatically. These are terrible. 
So with all that being said, we have only one and a half sites to focus on. The songbirdtree.com is the main one, and marieforleo.com is the half site because of its blogging layout, which I don't consider optimal for selling. Going back to 99designs, I'm going to download all these attached files so we can see what the client has prepared for us. We have several photos of himself, some in color and some in black and white. The good thing is they're pretty large. The bad thing is most of them are not appropriate for any good hero area. We'll get into that soon enough. It's nice he included his logo in several versions and formats. Okay, we've wrapped up this introduction section and I have to say I have a pretty clear idea about how I want my design to look. The brief, though initially not helpful, once broken down into pieces, did give me a strong sense of where I need to go. So let's jump into Photoshop and start laying down some elements. Setting the layout. To set the layouts, we're going to jump into Photoshop in the 960 grid file. Based on what we've read so far in the brief, I'm pretty certain about what I want the website to look like. I'm going for a clear, fairly simple, modern design with strong calls to action everywhere. The client likes mediocre websites, so those aren't anything to highly regard. There's a chance he's looking for more of a blog layout, hence the songbirdtree.com and marieforleo.com. But I won't go down that road for two reasons. One, those types of sites don't sell as well as presentation websites. The user tends to go through the everyday posts and I feel they're distracted from actually putting in their information. And two, a blog design wouldn't be as interesting for this course. Why 960? Simply because I believe it's a safer approach. The client seems older, he's a singer, and his inspiration websites don't look that modern, so I'd rather be on the conservative end. Plus, it's harder to shrink a design down from 1170 to 960 pixels active area simply because the client will see everything well laid out, spaced out nicely, with two to three columns width-wise. But then when you shrink it down, you obviously have to make some sacrifices. At that point, the client will inevitably compare the two and he'll have a feeling that the shrunken design is crowded or cluttered. That's my thought process considering the type of client he is. If this were a tech company, I'd probably use the 1170 grid. And in case I had to resize it to 960, since the client would be more tech-savvy, he wouldn't have the same cluttered impression. So it really depends on your type of client. Okay, with that out of the way, let's do it. Control semicolon to open up the guides, and then Control alt semicolon to lock them into place. I'm certain I want a horizontal type of design that spans the entire width. I find this is particularly helpful when dealing with 960 websites, because they feel wider than they actually are. So I'm going to use some black rectangles to define my areas. The first one is going to hold my logo and my main menu. I might include a telephone number if possible. I'm not going to rename this layer because nothing is set in stone at this point. We're just laying this out roughly. Underneath we'll have our hero area and that should end a bit under the fold. I think that's an adequate amount of space. No reason to shrink it down at this point so it ends exactly at the fold because, like I previously mentioned, I don't think that much of it. I'll change the color of this layer so I can have a visual separation between them. You might see me toggle the guides on and off, so I won't mention that from now on since it's pretty basic. Use control semicolon to show or hide them. Okay, regarding our content area, I'm not set on anything at this point. I need to think about some strong selling points the client wants to bring forward. We need a testimonial section, that's for sure, but that's probably going to be at the end of the design. Besides that, I'm pretty sure he wants to present himself in a short bio or about me section. This achieves two things. It checks the branding checkbox he mentioned earlier, and it brings credibility and trust to the user. So we're surely going to have an area where we present the client, who in this case is the actual teacher. We'll see what else we can think of, but at this point let's create three horizontal sections. Make sure you change their color and resize the canvas if needed. I like to use Control alt c because this immediately brings up my canvas size. Alternatively, you can use the Crop tool to enlarge it, but I'd rather be precise with my height. This way I tend to stick to reasonable lengths because I can clearly set my limit. 2500 pixels is pretty good, not too much scrolling, though for this particular site we could go for upwards to 4500 pixels because of its selling nature. Lastly, we'll add some type of footer, but I'd say we should stick with a medium to large one. Minimal footers are a bit outdated. Still, it's pretty early in the design phase, so let's not decide anything yet. 
Okay, now we have something laid out and we need to focus on bringing in some content. We'll do that in the next video so we have things nice and clean.